Mike Pacelli here with you. Thanks for spending some time with me for this lesson. I'll talk about Love Me Do as recorded on September 4th, 1962 uh, by the Beatles. Uh, it's a legendary song and the first song professionally recorded and uh, released by the Fab Four final lineup, you know, with John, Paul, George, and Ringo. There had been some other Beatle uh, releases uh, of with Tony Sheridan and also the Beat Brothers. But um, this is the first song in, in, in a seminal song in their career. A very simple one, but one I think you should have in your, your trick bag. Uh, Paul started writing it in 1958 about his girlfriend, then uh, Iris Caldwell, and uh, Paul finished it with John at uh, Paul's dad's house on Fourth on the Road. And basically, Paul wrote uh, uh, the verses, the lyrics, which, by the way, George Martin hated, <laughs> and uh, John wrote the bridge. Uh, the lyrics uh, were inspired by Lewis Carroll's um, Alice uh, Stop Dreaming Do. That's kind of where they got the little do thing. And uh, it was originally in the key of A, sort of like Buddy Holly's uh, Maybe Baby. But when they went down on June 6th, um, 1962, for their uh, audition recording uh, at EMI, um, they moved it to the key of G, and they tried to make it a little more bluesy, which Paul later said they failed because, well, well they were white English guys. Um, so they went to, on June 6th, and they had um, Pete Best on drums, and they recorded a version of, of Love Me Do. Uh, John wanted it, wanted the band to have the first uh, UK record where it featured a harmonica uh, that he stole in Holland on the way back from a gig in, in Germany. Um, when they started that session, um, George Martin wasn't there. It was Ron Richards producing the, uh, that session. And uh, when the engineer Norman Smith heard you know, John playing the harmonica on Love Me Do, he uh, sent for George Martin. George Martin comes in, and George Martin really liked the, uh, the, the harmonica. So uh, uh, they sally forth, <laughs> but uh, George Martin didn't like Pete Best at all. So uh, that was kind of the nail in Pete Best's coffin. The Beatles were thinking about getting rid of Pete Best anyhow and, and replacing him with Ringo, but once George Martin didn't, didn't think Pete Best was very good, that was it. So then the Beatles were uh, booked to return back to EMI on September 4th, and they came with Ringo. And uh, uh, they recorded another version of, uh, of Love Me Do. Uh, when they showed up, uh, George Harrison had a black eye. Because apparently uh, at a gig, I think at the Cavern, um, some Pete Best fans, uh, you know, weren't too happy about Ringo being in. And somebody head-butted George Harrison. So he shows up at the session with a, uh, with a black eye. Um, so they recorded with Ringo. It took 15 takes to get a good... Um, you know, instrumental version of Love Me Do. And what they would do, they're, it's, they're recording a one track, mono, so all their instruments done live on, on a mono, and then they were going to bounce the instruments from one mono tape recorder to another, and while they're bouncing, then uh, John and Paul would sing their Everly Brothers type wonderful harmony uh, vocals on onto the second tape recorder. And, and, and that's how they would, you know, get the final master. Now, interesting is that um, Paul tells his heebie-jeebie story a lot where he was uh, kind of forced to sing the end of Love Me Do because John had done it live, you know, please love me, and then John would, you know, would grab the harmonica and start going, you know, um, it's in the wrong key, oh, that's in B flat, should be in C, which I'll use the proper one for when I do the thing at the end, but uh, since they, they did all the music on one track, and they were bouncing that one track to another track, you know, John could have played it there, and then he could have sang it as they bounced to the next uh, one-track machine. So I don't know why they didn't do that. Any road, um, you know, they, did, they, did, they got it done, but again, George, George Martin wasn't pleased with Ringo's playing on that. So they booked him back in an, uh, uh, I think September 11th to come back, and when they come back, George Martin has a session drummer there. Uh, his name is Andy White, and he's like, you know, 10 years older than the lads. So, could you imagine Lennon going, okay, who's this uh, Andy White guy? And uh, so they recorded another version of Love Me Do, and they relegated Ringo to play tambourine while Andy White played, played drums. So, uh, Ringo was mad at, uh, at uh, George Martin for many, many years because uh, of that fact, and... Um, Andy White also plays on P.S. I Love You, too. 
and uh, it was just a, a sore spot for Ringo for many, many years. And a another crazy thing is that George Martin destroyed the master where Ringo is playing on Love Me Do, um, apparently so that you know all subsequent releases of Love Me Do would have Andy White, who, who George Martin preferred. But uh, um, it, it was released on uh, October, I think, 5th, 1962, in the UK as a single with Ringo playing drums, and uh, on the Please Please Me album with Andy White on, uh, I think, March 22nd, 63. You can hear the Ringo version on the Past Masters uh, album by the Beatles. But it's funny, since the master was the original master of Ringo playing was destroyed, they had to find a virgin copy of the 45, and I think they got it in Canada, in order to make a new master to put on the Past Master record so we could hear Ringo's playing. Uh, it was released in the U.S., I think January 10th, 64, on VJ, and then later on, uh, on uh, Tolly Records. But uh, that's pretty much the backstory. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about the one recorded with Ringo because, uh, you know, that's, that's the Beatles. That's the final, final lineup, and it's my favorite version because I think it has more fidelity and it has, you know, the Ringo swing. So let's get started. There's only one guitar on Love Me Do, and it's played by George Harrison on a uh, Gibson J160E similar to this uh, remake. Fun facts to know and tell, he was actually using his duo jet for a while uh, when they were trying to record it, but uh, wisely, um, they decided to do it on acoustic. And uh, it's a very simple song, but uh, there's a couple little tricks I want to show you that, uh, that may help. Um, you'll need just three chords to play the song. You need a G, like this. Jangly G. You need a C, like this. A jangly C. And you need a D, like this. Now, why do I say they're jangly chords? Well, if you were playing guitar back in the 60s and you learned a, a G chord, 50s or 60s, you just learned this one. That was your G chord in every book. But uh, wisely, George Harrison knew to put an extra D in there and get a little sound so it's janglier and when he plays um his c chord he keeps a g on top there because again if you were playing guitar in the 50s and 60s and you got yourself a chord book or you took lessons and and you learned a c chord it was this that was your c chord but george keeps the g on top and it's more you know beatles jangly right so you have those chords now, the rhythm is deceptively simple. Uh, the first measure is just quarter notes, where he's playing the G chord, and he plays one, two, three, four, right? Now, it takes a little precision, and for beginners, this is important to think about. Um, although he's voicing the, the G and the B, the root and the third of the chord, he's pretty much only hitting the low string, and and it's almost uh, uh, like a, a ghost note, that extra B. So you want to practice kind of fingering it like this, but uh, predominantly making the sound from the sixth string. Okay? Now when he gets to the C chord, he's going to mute the E string with his thumb, so you don't hear the... You just hear... And it takes some precision to be able to go from the G to the C properly. And the rhythm on the C is one, two, and three, and four. So you got one, two, three, four, one, two, and three, and four. All right, real slow. <laughs> Thank goodness George didn't make it uh, like a country song, because Paul's uh, you know doing a lot of root fifth. You know, Paul's going. So George could have made that C. Could have been. Could have been. But it's more rocky the way George did it. Now, of note, when George switches between the C and the G, he kind of lifts up his hand and you 
if you're going to write this out strictly, and I will do this on my chart and tabs, you'd almost have to, on the and of four of the second measure off the C chord, have a, a little G, like a, a, a D, G, B, kind of ghosted in there. Because he lifts up his hand and almost hammers onto the G. So it's, if I would do it very slow, and I'll accentuate the and of four on the second measure, it would be... But it's just, it's kind of ghosted that little on the end of four up. He's lifting off the C and, and, and it helps to make the song swing because if you were to do it just straight eighths, like, you know. It'd always be a pause. But if you just keep your hand, you know, moving forward and driving the song, then you get the, you get the little ghost when you pick up the C chord to get to the G. So play the tempo. Accentuated it there, but that's what he's doing. The hand is just continually rolling, and as he picks up that chord and almost hammers onto the G, you get kind of a little ghost. And then he goes to the D chord and he continues the same rhythm. And again, when he picks up the D to the C, you almost get that subliminal or ghosted G chord. So. breaks from the rhythm pattern on dun dun. So I'll do that slow from the D. Right? Very cool stuff and just, you know, seems really simple, but work on it to try to, to uh, get the ghosting and also to you know mute with your your uh, your thumb so you get a clean C. All right, and the only difference in rhythm pattern on that would be uh, at the second part of the harmonica solo. And it's a, and it's a little interesting here too because usually on all Beatle records when there's a solo they play uh, the the solo chords of the verse, but this song they play John plays a harmonica solo on the middle eight or or bridge uh, chords. And the harmonica solo chords go like this. <laughs> There's a little at the very end. Because, uh, you know, that's uh, the hang on G. <laughs> Besides that, it's always just. Love me. So I advise you just to practice that very slowly first to make sure you get the, you know, the right swing. Even though you can write this out in straight eighths, they're always their eighth notes. The Beatles have a certain amount of swing. And what I mean by swing eighth notes, it's not, they're not real rigid. It's not just da, 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 da. It's almost like the last eighth notes or the, the, the eighth notes that appear on the upbeat come a little later. And they're almost like somewhere in between eighth notes and, and sixteenth notes, and that gives everything a little swing. It's not real, you know. It's not. It's not real stiff ever. It's not. It always has a little moving forward, and that's what you want to work on. And you have to do that slow to get it. So you have to go. It's 
very fun to do, uh, very simple, but it's an important technique that uh, I hope you work on. So for fun again, I'll, I'll put it all together so uh, you can use it as a reference. So please check this out. And that's how you play Love Me Do by the Beatles. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to drop me a line, do so at MikePacelli.com and please subscribe to this channel. And like I always say, when you play these early Beatles songs, have fun doing it because that's what playing a guitar should be all about. I'm Mike Pacelli, and until next time, thanks for hanging out with me.